This is a photo of the sun taken in 1998 by scientists in Japan. And you may be thinking, well, it's not particularly good. Even I could take a better photo nowadays. Until I tell you that this image was not taken by a conventional camera or telescope, but was in fact taken 1,000 meters underground, requiring a facility containing 50,000 tons of ultra pure water. This is the story of the photo caught up in one of the biggest scientific breakthroughs in our understanding of matter in recent history. Now, you're probably still wondering what I meant when I said that this photo was not taken by a conventional camera, and how you'd be able to image the sun so far underground. The answer lies in the fact that this image was not taken by detecting photons, like most cameras do, but instead uses neutrinos. Neutrinos are small particles produced in many ways, such as in the fusion of hydrogen to form helium, which is the main mechanism our sun uses to produce energy. For many years, we weren't even aware of their existence, and for good reason. Neutrinos are notoriously hard to detect. At this very moment in time, there are around 100 billion neutrinos passing through your thumbnail per second, since most of the time, neutrinos pass straight through matter, and according to the standard model, they have no charge or mass, which makes it even harder to measure these particles. Neutrinos come in three different types, electron neutrinos, muon neutrinos, and tau neutrinos. But it's the electron neutrinos that this image focuses on, since these are the particles released in a hydrogen fusion reaction in the sun. So how do you go about measuring a particle which barely interacts with anything? Well, the answer is it depends and it's complicated. For instance, to make this image, the Super K detector in Japan was used, which makes use of a huge volume of water in the hope that the enormity of it will allow for some neutrino interactions. When a neutrino does interact with the water, blue Cherenkov radiation is emitted, and this is detected by the photomultiplier tubes surrounding the water. The reason for placing it so far underground is to protect the experiment from cosmic rays and other background sources of radiation, which would ruin the results. And since the neutrinos can pass straight through the Earth anyways, you can still detect them. This is the reason as to why they could image the sun from underground, as neutrinos could reach places that photons simply can't. And by collecting 500 days worth of data, you can build up an image of what the sun looks like in terms of the neutrinos it is emitting. Now, this wasn't just a publicity stunt to promote the wonders of science. There were legitimate reasons for building such a remarkable facility so far underground. And it turns out that some of these reasons were linked to a big problem in physics at the time, one which required a Nobel Prize winning solution. To understand this though, we need to go back in time to some of the early neutrino detectors. In the 60s, Physicists Ray Davis and John Bacall set out to measure the number of neutrinos our sun emitted, in an attempt to compare this to the number predicted by the best solar model at the time. The Homestake experiment, as it was known, made use of a chlorine-based detector 1500 meters underground in South Dakota, with the neutrinos being measured due to their interaction with chlorine producing radioactive argon. So if you could measure the amount of argon in your detector, you could calculate the number of neutrinos. In 1968, the first of their results were released, and it didn't look right. The number of detected neutrinos was a third of the theoretical value calculated from the solar model, prompting the scientific community to question whether the experiment was wrong or our understanding of the sun was wrong. Over the next 20 to 30 years, physicists set out to refine both the experiment and the calculations in the model of the sun in an attempt to uproot the cause of this huge discrepancy but despite the improvements science saw in new detectors built across the globe and theoretical models, there was still a big difference between these values. In this time, the Super K detector was built, which was designed to be sensitive to electron neutrinos, and along with producing our pretty picture from earlier, it also made measurements that still only gave a value of around half the expected number. So where did all the neutrinos go? The answer came in 2001, when researchers at the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory announced that they had solved the solar neutrino problem. The SNO had detected the number of electron neutrinos emitted by the Sun with high accuracy, yet had still arrived at a value of 30% of the expected number, about as good as the Homestake experiments over 30 years earlier. What was of note, though, was the discrepancy between this and the value Super K had reported. These were two very accurate detectors looking only for electron neutrinos, yet the values were different. 
suddenly the options appear to be narrowed down, as this difference can arise from differences in the experiment or differences in the thing that you're measuring. What if the Super-K experiment was measuring something that the SNO wasn't? By combining the data from both observatories, researchers at the SNO were able to calculate not just the number of electron neutrinos, but also the number of muon and tau neutrinos. What they found was the value predicted by the solar model, that the Super-K detector was also detecting some of these other neutrinos alongside electron neutrinos, and our understanding of the solar model was in fact correct. It's just that we were looking for the wrong thing. This story is amazing to me because it showcases a real battle in science of results which don't meet your expectations, and the lengths that researchers went to validate each step of the logic. But there is one final piece to this puzzle which still needs answering. Where did the other neutrinos come from? At the start of this video, I mentioned that the neutrinos produced in a hydrogen fusion reaction are electron neutrinos, and that is true as far as we know. It's in 1998 that evidence for a phenomenon known as neutrino oscillation was experimentally put forwards, with the 2001 SNO results confirming that solar neutrinos can oscillate. Neutrino oscillation is a process in which neutrinos can change their type, like the electron neutrinos coming from our sun changing into tau or muon neutrinos, and this can only happen if neutrinos have mass. I know I said earlier that neutrinos were massless, and that was kind of true to our understanding of the standard model at the time, but it turns out that neutrinos having mass was the real reason to this problem the entire time, and it was actually suggested by Pontecorvo after the results of the Homestake experiment that if neutrinos had mass, they would be able to oscillate and produce the results which we kept on getting. It's remarkable that it took over 30 years to verify this experimentally, but even more remarkable is the fact that our understanding of the standard model was changed forever due to scientists measuring and taking photos of the sun from underground, something which just seems so ridiculous and counterintuitive, especially given the timescale over which this all happened. If Davis and Bacall hadn't been looking for ways to test our solar model, would we have found out about neutrino oscillation at all? It seems unlikely that we would have remained ignorant to this fact to this day, but it does still make you wonder and also admire the scientific process of prediction and experiment behind such a discovery, the tried and tested method which is still being used to this day in our pursuit of understanding the way in which our universe works.